Has America drifted away from our moorings? Have we lost our passion as a people who were originally dedicated to preserving our glorious patriotic heritage? Have we lost our way? You must know that America began as a godly nation birthed in a, a painful pursuit of freedom. So today I ask, is our freedom being stolen piece by piece? Our Americans, once again at risk of being ruled by tyrants. Can we regain our vision of hope and rekindle our commitment to resist tyranny and to live free? What even matters to us anymore? Have the foundations been so weakened and truth so eviscerated that the opinions of the uninformed now outweigh the unimpeachable facts of history? A brief glance at the news or social media might call our future into question. So I choose to look back to our origins. I have a great hope today. I still believe we live in the greatest nation on earth, and I will not idly watch the fire of freedom die out. We must be more than the ashes of a once great society. We're Americans, and we can be proud of our history, but only if we know our history. Not the revisionist nonsense promoted by anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-family, anti-everything that doesn't support their turn America upside down and start over agenda. Some people want to wreck the nation because they believe America is a pathetic, racist, hateful, spiteful country built on slavery and inequality. I disagree. Yes, like every nation, ours has high points and low points, but I don't think we can afford to yield our past or our future to those who hate America and diminish everything good and glorious about our country. There are those at work in our land, in our schools, and even in our government who seem bent on destroying our history and rewriting it to fit their perverted agenda. Some of these prostituted false prophets want to see an America that is bereft of patriotism and devoid of faith in God. They would prefer us to be dependent on government and wary of old-fashioned morality. Many would even have us believe that they are winning the culture wars and God is no longer relevant. They seek a world where the government is worshipped. They value feelings and opinions more than Bibles or constitutions. They await the day that marriages and traditional family units are replaced with temporary agreements between any combination of consensual pronouns that seem satisfactory until a new perversion comes along. They promote a revisionist history of America that breeds contempt and distrust for the things that made us great. I reject their propaganda. I pray their influence in Washington will go away. And I hope true Americans agree. Therefore, instead of wasting any more time on the nonsense spewed by America's real domestic enemies in Congress or those running our colleges into the ground, I want to propose a better idea. I have an American idea. I want to fan the embers of the original fire that became a blaze that changed the world. And I'm here to welcome you to Free at Last, a Crosstalk Look at Independence Day. Let the festivities begin. We are free at last. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can trust God, or we can trust the government. My name is Randy Weiss. I'm a Jewish believer in our Jewish Messiah. I'm a first-generation American, and I love my country. I want to welcome you to this special edition of Crosstalk. I am the son of Jewish immigrants who fled their land to escape religious persecution. In America, my family became free at last. Perhaps that is why this season and this special project is so important to me. Independence Day celebrates our divine right of freedom. 
I appreciate liberty. I also want to make sure that as many people as possible understand the interesting Jewish connection to the history of the freedom that we enjoy in America. I have some little known facts to discuss that will surprise you, and I hope you will enjoy our time together. You see, history matters, truth matters, freedom matters, and nothing symbolizes freedom and liberty like the 4th of July. It is America's celebration of freedom. And there's a reason that America set the standard for liberty. On June 3rd, 1776, John Adams wrote a letter to Patrick Henry in which he said, the decree is gone forth and it cannot be recalled that a more equal liberty than has prevailed in other parts of the earth must be established in America. One month and one day later, July 4th, 1776, the history of the modern world was changed forever. And contrary to what America's detractors will tell you, a declaration was issued that did lead to a more equal liberty than was ever enjoyed by any people anywhere on earth. And I have the privilege of telling you a little bit about this amazing story of how we became free at last. Every great leap for mankind begins with an idea. America was ready for the idea of freedom. The innovation of America was a belief that freedom comes from God, not from man. Freedom is a divine right, not a commodity to be marketed by politicians. Our founding fathers believed in God, and they proved willing to lay their lives down to protect their God-granted freedom. You see, in earlier days, it was not universally agreed that liberty was a right from the Almighty. In fact, some assumed that, well, freedom was to be limited. It was a benefit that it was conditional and it was granted by the government. You see, during the colonial days of America, England controlled our destiny and dispensed freedom in limited quantities at their pleasure. In 1765, John Adams brilliantly explained the innovative view birthed by our forefathers when he poignantly declared let the pulpit resound with the doctrine and sentiments of religious liberty. Let us hear of the dignity of man's nature and the noble rank he holds among the works of God. Let it be known that British liberties are not the grant of princes and parliaments. This exciting belief resounded across America. This nation, above all before it, was founded on a belief in God and in the freedom that He ordains. It is how we became free at last. The American Revolution was the vehicle that delivered the divine right of freedom enjoyed in this great land. However, the freedom train moved slowly and many resisted. Do you know the difference between a revolt and a revolution, well, the difference is usually determined by the winner. Revolts are put down. Revolutions, like ours, overcome. Even in the dictionary, revolt comes before revolution. The leaders of a revolt are usually tried as treasonous criminals and then executed, whereas the leaders of a revolution are celebrated as heroes and then elected to office and awarded medals. But we must all understand that the American Revolution was a real roll of the dice for the fellows whose faces now adorn our currency. The shot heard around the world that launched our revolution could have backfired. Freedom came hard and it came slow. In 1774, delegates from each of the 13 colonies gathered in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. They were all unhappy about British control, but they were not all willing to fight a war to gain their freedom. 
The following May, in 1775, the Second Continental Congress dealt with the same ongoing problems. But war was still not yet an acceptable alternative. Finally, in June of 1776, when it became clear that resolution with England was impossible, a committee was formed to write a decree defining our goals for freedom. The distinguished team included, among others, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is credited with writing the document, but one of his biographers recognized that Thomas Jefferson probably plagiarized much of his version of the Declaration from a Presbyterian clergyman named Ephraim Brevard. He was a well-trained Princeton graduate, and he was a faithful Christian. Brevard was part of a patriotic group of 27 staunch Calvinists who notified England that they declared themselves free from British rule. The Mecklenburg Declaration, as it was known, was drafted more than a year before the Declaration of Independence. Studying the text of both documents, it is clear that one borrowed from the other, yet both defined our sentiments in the clearest of terms, and no one who understands our history can separate God from our founding fathers or from our freedom, because our freedom is a divine right that God has granted. We can't separate these things. Apart from God's desire for us to be free, we would not be free. And we understood this. And these men wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. And so we did. We unilaterally abolished one form of government to form another government. <laughs> A few of our modern politicians would do well to learn that lesson. Americans pursued our divine right of freedom. It was a sovereign grant from God, not a limited right from the crown of England. And this Declaration of Independence launched us on the road to freedom. America's desire to be free was greater than England's ability to maintain their oppressive reign of control. Neither British royalty nor England's military could restrain the divine impulse to be free that God had birthed in the American spirit. Today, we love and respect our friends in Great Britain, but we do so as peers because we are free at last. We serve together as willing agents for good in this world, but it was a much different world in 1776. At that time, America was little more than 13 loosely organized colonies living under the common rule of England's King George III. We paid taxes to England, but we had no voice in the English Parliament. Taxation without representation became one more rallying point for colonial revolutionaries. Still, the Declaration of Independence, it was a tough sell. Many thought the cost was too high. Freedom is often costly. It is never free. Someone always pays for it before it is granted. But I rejoice that we are free at last. As a Jewish man who believes in Jesus, I'm part of a very small minority in America. But even this tiniest of segments of Americans have been granted certain freedoms that are protected by the legal structure of our great nation. 
Therefore, I am thankful for our Declaration of Independence. By the way, do you know the official name for our most famous American document? It is actually titled, The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America. <laughs> this is really quite remarkable because contrary to popular belief, it was not originally approved unanimously. The simple fact is that of the 13 colonies that voted, only nine approved the document. Delaware couldn't make up its mind, New York abstained, and two states initially voted against the resolution. South Carolina rejected the Declaration of Independence, and incredibly, Pennsylvania, the state where it was celebrated and signed, also voted against the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. Isn't history odd? <laughs> Look, I, I, I just love my country, and I'm glad our forefathers eventually got together on the idea of a free and independent America. They are why we are free at last. Liberty means something very special to, to every Jew because we have not always been free. To remind us, every year at Passover, my family and I recite from the Haggadah and we confess as commanded by God that we were slaves in Egypt. I am a freeborn citizen of a race of former slaves. Our deliverance came by the mighty hand of God, who sent Moshe Rabbeinu, our beloved Rabbi Moses. Well, I must quiz you now. Do you know where Moses fits into the glorious history of America's Independence Day celebration? I promise you this is something every red-blooded American believer should know. Welcome back to Crosstalk. Do you know the wonderful link between the great Jewish Rabbi Moses and America's 4th of July celebration? Can you make the connection? Have you ever heard of the old statehouse bell? It's really quite impressive. The great bell weighs over 2,000 pounds. It was first rung in July of 1776 to announce the adoption of America's Declaration of Independence. The old State House Bell has a glorious history that I'll discuss in another edition of Crosstalk. But for those who call us racists and accuse people who believe the Bible to be guilty of all of society's ills, I'd like to remind those anti-American Americans that it was because of faithful Christian abolitionists that slavery was finally rejected. In fact, in large part, it was the Christian abolitionists of pre-Civil War America who fell in love with the old State House Bell, and all for which it stood. You see, in 1839, they gave it a new name to fit their cause, and a righteous cause it was. They began calling it the Liberty Bell. The new name stuck. To this day, it is still called the Liberty Bell. Abolitionists rightly hated slavery. They wanted every slave in America to be set free so that all Americans, not just white Americans, could enjoy our God-given liberty. They understood the meaning and the source of the words engraved on that symbol of freedom. Did you know that it is the words of Moses that are inscribed on the Liberty Bell? They read, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. You see, the idea of a jubilee of freedom came from the Lord. God wanted us to be free, and through Him we are free at last. And yes, one of America's most famous, most enduring symbols of freedom is inextricably linked to the Jewish scriptures and to Moses. It makes me proud to be an American. It makes me proud to be a Jewish American. In the meantime, let me tell you a little father-son story about Jubilee. When I was a child, I lived in Gary, Indiana. When our city turned 50 years old, Gary celebrated their Jubilee. 
it was a grand occasion with parades and festivities. All the men grew funny beards and wore derby hats. My dad and I took part in the Jubilee. Well, he grew the beard and we both wore the derbies. But the only thing that really changed was that at the end of the year, the men shaved their funny beards and the derby hats went up into the attic. The Jubilee of the Bible was much more dramatic. In God's economy, when the year of Jubilee came, everything changed. This cannot be overstated, and you must grasp the magnitude of this connection. Jubilee meant freedom, true freedom. If you were in debt, your debts were forgiven in the year of Jubilee. If your home had been repossessed or your farm had been lost in a foreclosure, in the year of Jubilee, your property was restored. Every 50 years, God wanted to make sure that each family in Israel had a chance to have their slate wiped clean, giving the impoverished a fresh start. His plan included measures for restoration and redemption. It was the perfect amnesty program, better than any government initiative, whereby politicians in Washington buy the votes of one group of citizens by forgetting a category of debts such as student loans and quietly assigning the obligations to be paid by another group of taxpaying citizens who can't figure out how to stop the madness. We can trust God or we can trust the government. I wish we'd trusted God instead. He prepared the most incredible plan to avoid the cycle of poverty that plagues so many families in so many nations. God called his plan Jubilee. When God's plan was followed, it led to a tr tremendous celebrations because the best part of God's idea of freedom was that in that special 50th year, when the ram's horn sounded, on that special day of atonement, in the year of Jubilee, all the slaves were to be released. These were the people at the very bottom of the economic food chain. These were the marginalized. These were the pitiful, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These were the wretched refuse and tempest-tossed who had no hope except for God. You see, in the year of Jubilee, all the slaves were to be set free. Freedom has always been God's idea. Redemption is God's specialty. But the people of God ignored His commands regarding the year of Jubilee. Slaves were valuable. Lenders didn't want to forgive debts. Landowners wanted to keep what they had obtained. Greed overtook people and poverty enslaved, where God preferred to let freedom ring. Sadly, None of us have seen the year of Jubilee celebrated as God commanded. It has been several thousand years since His people have honored this aspect of God's law. Better historians than I compute that the actual year in which Jesus Christ was crucified was one of those rare years of Jubilee. I guess that is why He is called the Redeemer. Now, there's much more to consider about God's Jubilee, but that discussion will need to wait for another episode. But what do you think of Jubilee? Do you need a freedom that goes beyond an evening of fireworks on the 4th of July? Are you waiting for your debts to be forgiven? Are you enslaved to a problem with the need to be set free by a Redeemer? What you need is God's Jubilee. Jubilee brings true freedom. It is God's promise of redemption. Now, you may find this shocking, but personally, even though I am Jewish, I believe that God's perfect picture of our Jubilee might best be seen in Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus came to set the captives free. God promises to redeem each impoverished soul who will believe. Jesus is the reason I am free at last. How about you? You know, if you're interested in what I discussed regarding Passover and the Jews being slaves in Egypt and the freedom that God has brought to us, I would 
love for you to be able to get a copy of my book, The Passover Backstory. And we have free electronic copies available, or you can order the paperback books on our website. If you're interested in the Jubilee and that special Jubilee that will be on that Day of Atonement that we all look forward to, to the return of the Messiah, perhaps you'd be interested in this book, God Forgive Me. I will point out that the subtitle is, Sure, but something or someone has to die. This is a book that describes in very clear detail the Jewish view of sacrifice and atonement and the Christian view of sacrifice and atonement. And I try to present a thorough historical analysis to make that comparison so that Jews and Christians can understand what each other believes. Thank you for allowing me to take a few moments during this season of freedom to confess that I am a living witness to the fact that Jesus sets us free. I probably seem pretty respectable sitting at a desk with a haircut and a PhD. I can now pass for being respectable, but a lot has changed in my life. I do come from a wonderful Jewish family and no man can lay claim to having been blessed with finer parents than mine. Nevertheless, through a series of bad decisions that I made beginning in 1968, I was in bondage. I was enslaved to sin. I used everything from hash to heroin. I loved cocaine, speed, LSD, and an entire myriad of drugs that secretly controlled my life. And I guess it wasn't so secret. I was a big time user and a small time pusher and I was on a road to certain destruction. My world was a series of daily reckless actions. Illicit behavior, illegal abortion, and selfish motives brought pain and terrible disappointment to, to many people. I guess because I was Jewish, no one ever told me about Jesus. Nobody loved me enough to tell me that I could be free. And then suddenly, in God's perfect timing, I was delivered from that bondage into the light of liberty. It happened in early 1973. God revealed his love to me. He saved me. He called me to himself. He sent me to the nations to carry the gospel. And I have known perfect freedom ever since that day I met my Jewish Messiah. It's great to be an American. I love our liberty and the freedom of religion that permits even a Jewish guy like me to tell the world about my Jesus. It's great to celebrate this season of American independence, but it is even greater to experience the freedom that can only come from God. If you would like to learn more about these matters, please like and subscribe to our free YouTube channel. I hope you're enjoying our free podcasts and I'd love to hear from you. Write to me, randy at crosstalk.org. Give us a call, toll free, 1-800-688-3422. It would truly be my greatest privilege to join you in praying for your prayer requests. So please contact me today. My name is Randy Weiss. This is Crosstalk. Till next time, shalom. And have a fantastic Independence Day.